The Kindly Ghost The biblical story of Joseph and his brothers appearing as an African folktale surprised some collectors. But the Sudan, where this example was collected by Amina Shah, is geographically and historically linked with Egypt, and the diffusion problem is not great, though it is not known how long this tale has been extant in oral form. Much more puzzling is the appearance of this story in Hawaii as Orkeli and the Water of Life, and in at least one other version as well. This tale was recited to amazed missionaries by Polynesians before they had been told the biblical versions. This narrative and other recognizably related tales from the world's stock of stories are found among the Maoris of New Zealand and in Tonga, the Marquesas and Samoa. They are, in fact, pan-Polynesian, and the themes involved are encountered, too, in cultures ranging from Zulu to Eskimo to Semitic. Once there were three brothers who were wandering about looking for water. After a lot of walking, they got to where one tree was standing alone, far away from any other. They were very thirsty and tired, so they sat down under the tree. Presently, when they felt better, the two elder brothers said to each other, Let us go on further and leave Ahmad here, as he will only be troublesome to us, for he cannot walk as fast as we can. And if we do find water, why should we have to have one third each instead of half? So when the younger brother slept, they both ran off and left him. At last it was evening, the sun had gone down, and Ahmad woke with a start. Where are you, brothers? he cried in fear, in the darkness. But there was no reply. He was terrified and called again. Suddenly a ripe fruit fell out of the tree and hit him on the shoulder. He ate it greedily, as it tasted delicious, and he thought he would not save any for his brothers. Wild animals began to call in the surrounding desert land, so Ahmad quickly got into the hollow of the tree. It was comfortable and safe from the prowling creatures that hunted at night. When his eyes were accustomed to the dark, he saw that he was in a little room inside the tree, and there was a fine bow lying at his feet with a set of hunting arrows beside it. There was also an axe made of sharpest steel. In the morning, after he had had a good sleep, he went out with the axe, cut bark and creepers from the tree, and made a snare for animals. Hunting far and wide, he shot game. When he was thirsty, the tree seemed to know and dropped a sweet, juicy fruit from its topmost branches. Time went by, he did not know how long, but day after day he managed to feed himself and to quench his thirst from the fruit of the tree. In all that time, there was no rain. He was happy, though he kept wondering when his brothers would be returning. He never gave up hope that they would come back to find him when they discovered where there was water. One day, he found there was a small rat in his snare. He bent over it and heard it squeak, Let me out! Let me out! And when you need me, I will repay your kindness! He was very surprised to hear the rat speak with a human voice. He released it, and it darted away. The next day, when he came back from hunting, he found he had trapped a falcon. If you free me, I shall repay your kindness just when you need it, said the bird in a human voice. Ahmad released it, and it flew away high into the sky without saying any more. When night came, he squeezed himself into the hollow of the tree, and inside he saw the vision of a small grey man. How are you, my son? Have you got everything you need? he asked kindly. Not everything, father, said Ahmad, but sufficient for each day and night, I thank you. The old man said, Once upon a time, in the distant past, I too lived in this tree and I was so skilled in magical things 
that I only wished for a thing, for it to immediately appear before me. But of what use is anyone's poor magical power in the world of worlds? Ahmad looked on in amazement, hearing the old man talk, and seeing how radiant he appeared in the darkness of the tree's hollow. He could not speak for wonder. This will be of use to you, went on the old man. It is a magical pouch, and if you wish for something, it will make that thing happen. But wish for no evil thing, or evil will come upon you. Take your rest now, and when you need something, wish upon my magic pouch. The vision vanished, and Ahmad scarcely knew whether he had imagined him or not, except that the magic pouch was in his own hand. When morning came, he rose and went out into the dawn and looked around. All was desolate as before. With the magic pouch clasped in his fingers, he wished with all his heart for a village to spring up there, and trees, water, and friendly people. No sooner had he wished than there was a great rushing sound in his ears. He closed his eyes, and when he opened them, there was so much activity around him he was nearly pushed over. There were people buying and selling under his tree. There were goats bleating, small boys running and shouting, women carrying huge bundles hither and thither on their heads. There were several huts nearby, and old men were sitting outside them smoking. Best of all, there flowed nearby a fine, sparkling river. Ahmad ran to the water and, throwing himself down, splashed cold water on his face. He was in paradise, he thought. Now, walking around, with the magic pouch tied to his belt, he found it was a real village, though it appeared to be the village of his dreams. A respectable-looking elder beckoned him over to his doorway. Ahmad, welcome to your very own village, said he. Go, take those cattle over there, they are yours. And he pointed to a large herd of the finest animals Ahmad had ever seen. The days passed with many delights, and soon he was married to a pretty wife. One night, the little old ghost appeared to him, and Ahmad said to him, Thank you so much for all the wonderful things I have got through the miraculous pouch. Do not thank me, said the old man. I am not the one who has wrought these things. Well, take the pouch back then, and give it to whomsoever it belongs, said Ahmad. No, my son, you will still have need of it. It is yours for life said the ghostly visitor, and vanished. One evening, just as the sun had set, Ahmad and his wife were looking out towards the river when they saw two dusty, dirty, disheveled men staggering towards the village. They were none other than Ahmad's two brothers. Brother, brother, cried the elder, throwing himself at Ahmad's feet. Let us stay here and rest. We have searched so long for water, and now we have been told that you own this village and this river and all these cattle. Please forgive us for leaving you. Take us in and let us stay for a little while. Ahmad raised them up and gave them clean clothes, food and shelter. He asked them to stay in his village and be with him and his wife for as long as they wished. But instead of being really grateful, the two brothers began to be jealous of all that Ahmad now owned, and the respect which he was given by the villagers. One night they came to him and said, O oh brother, we are nothing here compared to you. We are going away. And Ahmad clenched his hands over the magic pouch and said, Let my brothers have each as fine a house as I have and pretty wives, and cattle, and let them be content. New houses sprang up, more cattle appeared, and two pretty wives came to the two men. The brothers were amazed at the magical properties of the pouch which was hanging from Ahmad's belt, and asked, Is that the source of all your wealth? 
And Ahmad told them, Yes, it was given to me in a dream by a little old man, and it is by holding it and wishing that I have got everything I have today. Then the brothers said, Let us have a look at that fabulous pouch then, so that we can see for ourselves. And Ahmad handed it over. No sooner had the elder brother got the pouch in his grasp than he cried, Let this village and all that is in it be swept away to a faraway place, and this part become desert again, with our dear brother Ahmad wandering about in it. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than the village, the river, the cattle and the people completely disappeared. Ahmad once more found himself alone without anything to his name but a ragged shirt and broken sandals. He could not understand what had happened. Surely it could not be due to his two brothers' greed and jealousy. Please, old grey father, tell me what to do, he cried in vain. No voice answered him, no kindly old man appeared. Far away, far from where Ahmad was lamenting, the happy people of his village laughed and played no more. They went about the day's work sadly, with averted faces. The wicked brothers lived like despotic monarchs, forcing everyone to bow down to them. Ahmad's pretty young wife sat alone in her house, eating nothing, grieving for her husband. What had happened she did not know, except that without him she wanted to die, as Ahmad seemed to have deserted her. But now something else happened. Each night the two brothers got no peace at all, for the ghost of the old grey man went from one to the other, singing and moaning and wailing giving out strange sounds all night long. They got up in the morning weary and fretful, and dared not go to bed for fear of the old ghost. No matter where they slept, they could not escape him. All this time, Ahmad was wandering and looking for his village and his wife, when one day a rat jumped out of a hole in the ground at his feet. Ahmad, good Ahmad, listen to me. You allowed me to escape when I was caught in your snare. I will help you now. You are apparently in trouble, with no bow or arrows, no food in your belly, so far from water. What is the matter? Ahmad told the rat the whole story from beginning to end. Good deeds are not often repaid by kindness, said the rat. Bitter indeed is ingratitude. But wait, I will get the magic pouch back for you. And he darted away. Ahmad sat down beside the rat's hole and waited. After all, he had nothing to lose by waiting. The sun was not yet overhead, and he needed to rest anyway. The two brothers were fighting at that moment as to who was the true owner of the pouch. As it went from one to the other, it fell on the ground. In came the rat and snatched it between his teeth. Stop that rat! It's taking away the magic bag! cried the elder brother. The second brother picked it up, with the rat still clinging to it. They beat the rat with sticks, but still it held on. Then from the sky swooped a falcon, the one which Ahmad had released, and took the pouch in its beak. The rat escaped and ran away. Soon the pouch was laid at Ahmad's feet by the falcon. As soon as the pouch was in his fingers, Ahmad wished that his village could be returned to him with all it contained. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than he heard the lowing of his cattle, and his pretty wife came towards him with laughing eyes. But the two false brothers came to Ahmad with false smiles on their faces, and pretended that they knew nothing about the matter of the village being spirited away. Ahmad looked at them and saw them for what they were. He knew that if they remained there, trouble would always be in the air. Their ways are not my ways, said Ahmad to the magic pouch. Please let them be taken away to a village of their own where I will never go, and may I never set eyes upon them again. The two brothers vanished before his very eyes. 
So ever afterwards, the rat played in Ahmad's hut, and the falcon flew over the roof, and the magic pouch hung in readiness at his waist.